What's up, Live Different Podcast listeners? It is Matt coming to you in 2020. And I'm so excited to take my content to the next level, not only with the Live Different Podcast, but my first book, The Millennial Travel Guidebook. Plenty of details coming out on that. But wanted to shoot this first uh, quick little video, which you might be seeing on YouTube, on my channel, or on my new website, mattwilson.co. I wanted to make a recommitment to making excellent show notes where people can get all of the resources, uh, which you can, of course, find uh, on iTunes as well, link to all the things that we talk about in the podcast, and really take this thing to the next level. So a lot of exciting stuff content-wise coming out in 2020, but today we have a excellent interview with a neuro-ophthalmologist. Uh, her name is Dr. Ronnie Bannock. She is an MD and also someone who understands integrative and natural medicine. And uh, she gave, gave, gave me a ton of tips for keeping our eyesight, reducing eye strain, reducing all of these unnatural blue lights uh, that can keep us up at night and that can just hurt us overall and uh, you know give a lot of people migraines. She's a migraine expert as well. So if you've ever uh, struggled with any of those things or just want to make sure that you're not doing yourself any harm, I would absolutely uh, listen through to the end to this episode and check out the show notes where there are links to everything that she recommends at mattwilson.co. Happy 2020. I'm uh, just thrilled again to be able to get this book out. I'm going to launch a new podcast. Tons of exciting stuff. Thank you guys so much. Listen in for a great episode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Lift Different Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Wilson, and today I'm here with Dr. Ronnie Bannock. I am so excited to have her on today uh, because not only is she a functional doc and an MD, which I don't know that those two things are always the same uh, or are, are always go hand in hand, which I will ask Dr. Bannock here in a second, uh, but she is also a neuro-ophthalmologist, which I'm excited to even learn more about because I don't think it's the same as an optometrist now that I've really investigated how this word is spelled, but uh, she is an expert in a whole lot of different things, uh, but we're going to be talking today about how young people can keep their eyesight, which I think is so important, uh, and how people can get less migraines and headaches, for one, uh, how the light in our environment from fluorescence and blue lights from our screens can be damaging to our health, and what we can do to just overall uh, live better lives. I think that eye health in general and uh, combating the artificial light in our environment is such a complicated topic, and what we really want to do is help young people live better lives uh, and break it down for the everyday person today. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Rani, thank you very much for coming. Oh, thank you so much, Matt, for having me. I'm really, really excited to be here. Well, we're, we're excited to have you, and uh, I don't want to lose anybody in the weeds right off the bat, but I do want to know optometry, right, versus uh, what you practice, which is actually the connection between neuro, which must mean the brain, but ophthalmology. Did I, yes. did I say that right? Yes, that is correct. Ophthalmology. So, uh, uh, yes. so um, a lot of people don't know the difference between the different types of eye care providers out there. So I guess I can just clarify that. First. Please. So there are ophthalmologists, there are optometrists, and there are opticians. Mm. Um, ophthalmologists have um, actually gone to medical school. They have an MD and then done additional training. So uh, in ophthalmology, we do an internship followed by a residency and then sometimes a fellowship. Optometrists go to optometry school and they get a, um, an OD, uh, which is a doctor of optometry degree. And they also uh, take care of many different kinds of eye diseases, prescribing glasses, uh, basic medications, but they don't do surgery. And opticians are the eye care providers that actually make the glasses. So there are ah. three O's in the eye care world, so ophthalmology, optometry, and optician. 
and we all work together. So, um, so it's a nice collaboration that we have. No, that, that makes sense. And um, actually, could you tell people a little bit more? Maybe they've, <clears throat> there's so many words right now out there to describe, geez, I'm trying to pick which one I'm gonna use, but let's say alternative medicine. Okay, okay not, uh, not Western medicine and not um, allopathic medicine, but you have a specialized training in functional medicine. Some people call it integrative medicine. I don't know the yes. difference exactly, but if you could just tell everybody, you know, you have these letters MD, that means you're a real medical doctor, but you also have a specialized training in functional medicine. So if I'm an everyday person off the street and I'm trying to say, wait a second, I want somebody who's going to address the root cause of my issues. Who should you be going to? Who should you look for uh, to have kind of in your, uh, in your counsel, if you will. Mm -hmm. Sure, that's a great question. Actually, many people ask me, you know, what does it mean? What does it mean to be a functional doctor or an integrative doctor? So, I think the overall arching kind of categorization is um, in the alternative space. You have alternative medicine, which is um, really um, not uh, taking into account traditional medicine. So, let's say someone has a condition, for example, cancer. Let's say. And they say, I, you know, I've tried the traditional route and it's not working for me. I'm not getting better. I'm not, no longer going to do that. I'm going to try something totally different. And that's called alternative. So you're, you're kind of switching one out for the other. But what I do is actually trying to merge the two. So I take my traditional medical training. So that means taking care of eyes either uh, with glasses or with medications or with surgery when it's appropriate. And I merge it with a functional approach, which is, as you mentioned, a root cause approach. So what really is causing the problem? What is, you know, what's causing this eye issue, this blurry vision or dryness or, you know, uh, you know whatever the issue is. So I really dig deep. And the functional medicine is also um, a field where we don't take each organism in isolation. We kind of look at the whole body together. So you could also call it holistic medicine. So there's many right. different terms you could use, functional, integrative, holistic. To me, they pretty much all need the same thing. And it's just a way to kind of blend the two philosophies and to integrate more. You know, I'm very, very focused on nutrition as well as lifestyle for eye health, which, um, which many, even ophthalmologists, and many of my colleagues are just not... Uh, trained in and you know our traditional medical training that four years we spend in medical school and then the many years afterwards of additional training doesn't really focus on those important key um, components of eye health which again nutri the nutrients that we take in and what we're exposed to in our daily lives you know as you mentioned the light that we're exposed to or other toxins we may be exposed to or the stressors that we may be exposed to so again I try to just bring it all together and um, I do have this additional training. So I've trained with Institute for Functional Medicine, which is a wonderful organization. And a lot of providers belong to that. So not just doctors, but there are um, nutritionists, there are nurse practitioners, chiropractors, um, health coaches. So it's not just um, physicians uh, who are part of this organization, which is another thing I love because I work with other types of healthcare providers in this space. And it's really incredible to, to have that kind of impact on a patient's health, having a team approach. That's great because you are not just, you haven't pigeonholed yourself into one uh, approach and you have contact. Uh, it seems to me in Western medicine, so many people are just heads down on their one little thing, addressing their one little symptom. And unless they are uh, going to conferences and they are listening to, you know, reading other people's blogs and, and subscribe mm -hmm. to many different journals. They may just be focused on what they see every day coming into their office. And it may be very specialized. Uh, we had Dr. Ann Shippey on, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, you, you might know her, uh, yes, but absolutely. so she's an MD as well as a functional integrative doc. And, uh, I, I also feel maybe this is, well, uh, whatever. I know that if you've gone to medical school, you'll know your way around the hard science and the medical journals because you can go to, and I love these type of practitioners, but you can go to, as you said, a chiropractor or a shaman or a Chinese medical doctor or just a ND naturopath. Mm -hmm. and 
Well, how much of the hard science uh, do they know? Well, they didn't go to medical school, I'll, I'll say mm -hmm. that. Uh, and so anyway, um, that's a little side tangent, but I, I appreciate that you're, you're merging these fields. I, I think it's so, yeah, so, so important. And um, to, to really transition into how people can take care of their eyes in general, uh, what, what would you say? Because we spend so much time, as, as I alluded to before, in front of these lights, we're fixed mm -hmm. on a certain distance in front of our screens instead of our, in front of our phones at books. I don't know if that's all that good for us. Uh, how can everyday people, again, combat this crazy artificial world that we're now living in? Yeah, it's a challenge. It's a challenge that all of us face, you know, from kids all the way up until, you know, uh, older age. So how do we kind of minimize some of these influences in our world that we just can't get away from? Uh, so we can, I guess we can toss start with blue light, because I know that's on a lot of people's minds. Yes. Um, you know, is blue light, you know, safe? Is it is it hurting us? Is it harming us permanently in any way? Um, so I'll just start off by explaining that there are many, many different sources of blue light. So first of all, the sun is the greatest source of blue light. So of course, that's, you know, always thought of in a, in a positive way. And it is, but then now we have, you know, with our artificial lighting, we have so many other sources. So uh, any type of screen, whether it's your phone, your tablet, your computer, they all emit blue light. TV screens emit blue light. Um, fluorescence, a little bit, not so much, but CFL bulbs actually emit more blue light than fluorescent lights. Um, and LED, so anything with an LED panel emits blue light. And what blue light is, so we have, there's a whole spectrum of light. And this is just some basic, basic science here I'm just going to uh, kind of preface this with. So we have UV light, which is on the short end of the spectrum. It's light that we can't see. And then we have visible light, which is the typical uh, rainbow spectrum that we can see. And then we have infrared light, which is longer that we also can't see. So blue light is within, within the visible spectrum. It's very short wavelengths of light. And it's usually between 400 to 500 nanometers. And 400 to 450 is kind of the higher, um, really high energy, potentially harmful wavelengths. And fortunately, most of our devices, most of the lights, you know, CFL lights, don't have such short wavelengths that they emit. They emit slightly in the longer range, so 460 and above. So fortunately, you know, all this light that's coming at us can't necessarily, at least it hasn't been proven scientifically that it's actually going to harm our eyes or harm our bodies in any major way because it is a slightly longer wavelength of blue light. But that being said, people can have a lot of other symptoms when they're exposed to blue light. For example, um, I have a lot of patients who come to see me because they have light sensitivity. You know, the blue light that's coming from their screens is just making them very uncomfortable. Sometimes it can cause uh, dry eyes, it can cause headaches. Um, it can cause a whole uh, range of symptoms that we call digital eye strain. So it's a popular term in ophthalmology and optometry, digital eye strain, or some people call it computer vision syndrome. And it, again, it's, it's, it's a, um, it's a short-term effect of blue light. So again, it's not going to cause long-term damage to our eyes, to our retinas. It's not going to cause macular degeneration or cataracts. But it's something that can really impact our function. And if we're not comfortable, um, so I don't know if you or your listeners are aware of this, but um, do you know how much how much time most most people spend in front of a screen? Any guesses as to how many hours a day oh, the average geez. adult spends in front of a screen? Uh, that's a really good. Oh my God, that's a really good question, and I bet it's well, average adult. It depends, but if we're talking about uh, a young person with a office job, I mean, we could be, and then they go home and. Yeah, everybody likes to be on their on phones. The phone. Sure, yeah. yeah. And if your TV's on in the background, I mean, I don't have a television, but still a lot of people do. We could be talking 10, 12 hours a day. That's exactly right. You're My right God. on target. So the average is almost 11 hours a day in front of some kind of screen, which is crazy. I mean, you think about that. Um, it, it's you know unheard of, and that number will probably just keep going up You know, the more we get um, you know, we're so tied to our devices and so reliant on our devices. And even kids, I mean, the average time an average kid spends on a screen is over six hours a day. And that's mind-boggling. Wow. So, you know, again, there's no 
serious long-term effect that we know of from this, but short-term, yes, it can really bother us. So there's a couple of things I would suggest um, to try to counteract all of this, you know, extra light. It's, some people call it light pollution in mm -hmm. our lives that we're exposed to. So the first thing is simply put a screen filter on. There are some great screen filter apps that actually um, can, based on your time zone, where you are, when the sun's rising, when the sun's setting, it can actually adjust the blue light on your screen to match natural conditions. And after a certain time at night, it can actually block out all of the blue light. So the two apps that I recommend are Flux, so it's f.lux, or iristech.co. And there, I actually prefer Iris Tech because it has a lot of different um, combinations of settings that you can use. So, you know, there, of course, there's a nighttime setting, there's a healthy setting, there's a movie setting. So you can play around and see what you feel most comfortable with, depending on how much time you spend on a screen. Um, the other thing Great. you can Yeah, do I, I, I want to just chime in and say I, I love both of those apps. I prefer Iris as well. And for anybody looking, uh, I'm going to uh, put the show notes and some of the links to these resources uh, actually at my new website, mattwilson.co, mattwilson.co. So we'll try to get everybody, uh, you know, a lot of these have free trials. I think Flux is free and I think, uh, I think Iris is paid, but it's well worth the it's investment. So I think I have the lifetime forty dollar iris uh, yeah it's, it's very uh, manageable it's, it's not an exorbitant very good um, investment I, yeah it's, it's a great investment um the other thing that a lot of people ask me about is you know should i be wearing blue blocking glasses and there's so many companies out there that are marketing these blue blocking glasses but even if you're getting glasses you know your optician will ask you oh should i, should I put a blue blocker on it so um, one thing I'll just hmm. I'll just give you this this little uh, kind of backstory. So you know when I was doing my research on blue, blue light blue blocking glasses, I was looking for studies that actually looked at these blue blocking glasses to see if they really did what they were supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And the only study that I could find was from Consumer Reports. It was back in 2016, so it's a couple of years old. But what they did was they took the top three selling best selling blue blocking glasses on the market. And they tested them to see if they really blocked out the blue light. And the, the, there was only one out of the three that actually blocked out uh, almost 95% of the blue light. The other two only blocked about 30 or 40% of the blue light. So, um, so just keep that in mind. You know, when if you're shopping for blue blocking glasses, try to get something that will actually do what it's supposed to do. If you're wearing it, it might as well really, you know, you know, be effective. And a quick tip is, you know, if you're not sure, if you don't know, if your optician's not sure if it's really doing what it's supposed to do, is put on the glasses and look at your screen and look at something blue. And if you can still see that bright blue color, it's not really a blue blocking glass. It's not completely blocking out those rays. And um, I actually have some glasses here I'll just share with you. So I actually like these. I don't know if you can see them, but they're- Oh, I've got, uh, I've got them. I've got them. The true darks. The true darks, yeah. yes. So when I put these on, I mean, it makes, it cuts out all the blue light. It's actually like a reddish, a bright red color. Sure. And something like this, like if you're working late into the night, you have to be on your screen. It's best if you wear something that really completely cuts out that blue light because not only can it potentially cause that digital eye strain I was talking about, mm -hmm. but at nighttime, um, excessive exposure blue light really affects our circadian rhythms. It makes it very hard to fall asleep. Studies that show that if you use too much screen time right before bed, your um, you know your um, latency to sleep is about one or two hours later. So again, try to cut out those lights, or even you know if you have CFL bulbs or LED bulbs, try to use warmer tones. They actually sell smart lights now, which will actually adjust. Uh, mm -hmm. to the, you know, to your time zone, and it'll cut out the blue light. So, you know, use little things like that in your home or, you know, just, uh, you know, simple glasses sometimes can make a big difference. In Interesting. Terms of, yeah. No, that's great. And you could just, you can put them on and you can just tell once your eyes get more sensitive to blue lights. And I actually recently uh, stopped wearing sunglasses unless it was really, really bright uh, for me. I like to, and you can tell me from a um, from a eye doc perspective <laughs> what you think about this. But I would wear my polarized Ray Bans everywhere, and I started looking into the uh, research from people like Dr. Sachin Panda and uh, Jack Cruz, who talk about, <laughs> hey, look, your circadian rhythm is so fixated on the amount of 
blue light that you're getting from the sun, it's really good in the morning to make sure that you're getting this natural light and, you know, not telling your body that it's dark or, or just, you know, same with the blue light. You, when you blast yourself in the face with the blue light all day, you're saying it's 12 o'clock on a hot summer day, no matter what time of year or what time of day it is. Uh, so, I, yeah, I don't know how much that affects yeah, I don't know how much that affects the circadian rhythm, and and I've heard you know Dave Asprey talk about stuff about your inhibiting mitochondria function and all this, but because we're just talking about eyes, uh, absolutely. I mean, you can just you you can just tell with these with these glasses. But I w so wanted to ask you, you know. It's not good, as I understand, to wear those red light glasses all day. I, you know, yeah. you're not going to wear them when you're on your computer at work during the daytime. Uh, so do you have, you know, do you suggest people wear, I'm going to try out these, these kind of clear ones. I don't know how much they're going to do, but it's, they're from this company called Raw Optics. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't, do you have any opinions on what people can do during the day other than just dimming their screens and, and filtering? I mean, I think if you have symptoms of digital eye strain, then yes, you may want to try a lighter shade rather than the really dark amber or red colored ones. You know, a very light yellow, perhaps. There's, there are even blue blockers that are clear, and that will cut out some of the light. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that, um, you know, we were talking about that app, Iris Tech. Um, the other good thing about Iris Tech is not only does it block blue light, but it actually blocks out the flicker rate from the screen. Right. And what many people don't realize is that screens have a flicker rate and it's you know it's a it's an on off constant on off that are is so fast our eyes can't even pick it up but it's you know it's definitely picked up at some level within our retinas and um, it's the same flickering that happens when you look at a fluorescent light that's kind of going off and on and it's to save energy that that's really why this flicker rate is built in and sometimes people have a response to the flicker rate so that's why using the screen filter app is helpful but um, but you know to your point that not all blue light is harmful. You know, we definitely need blue light for our circadian rhythms. Um, blue light is actually used as therapy sometimes for certain conditions, like, for example, seasonal affective disorder. Sure. So it's not all bad. It's just the timing of it and, you know, the, the, the kind of um, the length of time that you're exposed to it all at once. So another quick tip I have is if you're going to be sitting at your computer for, you know, if you know you're going to be at the computer for several hours and you're doing work, um, Set your timer and use a, a rule that I like to say is called the 20-20 rule. So basically every 20 minutes, just kind of close your eyes and relax, take a few deep breaths, and then start up again. So every 20 minutes, take a 20-second break when you're not really looking at anything and just give your eyes that rest, and that will improve your endurance. Um, and then I think I, I just want to touch on, since we're talking about, you know, glasses and light, various kinds of light, you had mentioned before about um, wearing sunglasses when you're outside. So, um, so I know that there are different philosophies out there in terms of light exposure and, and um, you know, looking at the light, especially in early, early morning light can be beneficial. But what I would say is don't look at it for too long because the sun emits like, many different wavelengths of light. So the UV spectrum, which is UVA, UVB, UVC, those are the very, very short wavelengths of light that can potentially harm our eyes. They can lead to cataracts. They can lead to macular degeneration. So if you're going to do it, do it for a very short period of time. And if you're just out and about, if you're going to be, for example, spending the day at the beach, or if you're you know, going to be skiing and you have a lot of bright light coming at you, sure. you should probably wear 100% UVA and UVB blocking glasses. Now, they don't block the blue light because it's a different wavelength, but just look for that, that little label and, or sticker that says UVA, UVB blocking, because that will prevent a lot of long-term eye complications. Um, so, right. just, yeah. so again, just kind of keep in mind that there are different wavelengths of light. They're not all bad. And just kind of wear appropriate eyewear for the context that you're in, the situation that you're in. Yes. And I'm uh, obviously I'm very passionate about this stuff. And I want to actually ask you about headaches in a minute, because that when I'm on the water or I'm skiing, I need to have glasses on because I will get headaches. But first, I wanted to I wanted to ask you <laughs> um, Geez, what was it? Uh, okay, we can go to headaches, and I'll come back to that thought <laughs> in a, a thought in a minute. Um, but yeah, actually, so I don't surf, 
on a sunny day? Well, A, because I know it's a really, I, I lived in Costa Rica for seven years and it's a really easy way to get sunburn. But uh, also it's just too bright. That reflection is just too strong for me. Or if I'm out on the sun it, or if I'm out uh, skiing, that reflection from the snow is just, it's a lot. So I have to have my goggles on. Um, can you, yeah, can you comment at all mm -hmm. on how people can, can protect themselves, especially when they're doing, so they don't get the headaches. That's the other thing. I will get eye mm -hmm. strain and headache and it's, it's pretty debilitating. It's not fun. Yeah, no, it's, you're, you're, I, I'm the same way. I, you know, I'm very, very light sensitive. And um, so, so let, I'll just explain a little bit about headaches and then how the light sensitivity, sensitivity plays in. So um, headaches, so our brain really only has one sensory nerve that we can sense pain with. And that nerve is the trigeminal nerve. And it goes through, it covers our brain, it covers our scalp. That nerve also goes to our eye socket and our, and our eye. And so whenever that nerve gets irritated, it causes a headache. So whether it's a tension headache or a migraine, it's all because of this trigeminal nerve and all of its different branches and all the different nerve endings it has. It's a very, very sensitive nerve. It actually even goes to the sinuses, to the cheek, to the gums, to the teeth. So there's, again, many, many different branches in the face. So because there are branches to the cornea, which is on the very surface of the eye, um, the cornea is the, the curved surface of the eye that lets light come through. So sometimes when, um, when bright light comes in, it actually stimulates those branches of the trigeminal nerve in the cornea, and then that can trigger a headache. Hmm. So what you're experiencing, you know, when you're out there in the sun is not uncommon at all, is that really, really bright lights can definitely trigger headaches in some people. Um, for those situations, I would recommend getting the polarized glasses that you were talking about because the polarized glasses will cut the glare. So maybe getting UV protection with polarized lenses, that may be best for that situation. But, um, but since we're now on the topic of headaches, um, I, I actually just want to kind of give you my, my personal story of, of, of how I came into functional medicine, and it has to do with headaches. Hmm. So, um, so I am a migraine sufferer. And I started off with migraines when I was in my early 20s. And they were manageable, maybe one or two a year. But as I got older, they got to be very frequent. And there was a period of time in my life, about five, six years ago, when I'm, I was under a tremendous amount of stress. I wasn't taking care of myself. I wasn't eating right, sleeping right. And I developed migraines every single day. Hmm. Every single day, I would wake up with a migraine. And it's very debilitating. I don't know if, if you or your listeners have ever experienced one, but you know, it's like a stabbing sensation. You just want to crawl under the covers and not come out. And um, so basically, I went to every headache doctor I could find in New York City. I went to the top academic institutions. And doctor after doctor, these are you know headache specialists that I really is, you know, they're my colleagues. I, high, I hold them in very high esteem. But all they would do is write me a prescription. And they would say, oh, this is the latest new drug on the market. Try this and come back in two or three months. I tried all these different medications. Nothing worked. Absolutely nothing worked. And they just made me feel sick, made me feel you know, like a zombie. And finally, I said, you know what? I'm not taking any more medications. I have to fix this. I have to find a way to fix this. So I started to do research. And I realized that there are amazing other ways to treat headaches. So um, there are supplements. There are botanical agents, there's nutritional ways, lifestyle changes. And this is what really introduced me to the world of functional medicine. I mean, it was crazy. I never even knew that this whole field of medicine existed until about five or six years ago. I mean, that's, that's the, you know, the wow, irony. And, and you were an MD yourself at that point. Exactly. I mean, we Amazing. are not trained in this way. And it was really shocking to me. And, it, you know, some of it is... You could say it's common sense, but we were just never trained this way. We never had our minds. Oh, none of the headache doctors I'd ever seen ever once asked me, what are you eating? How much sleep do you get? How much caffeine do you get? And these were all the factors that were contributing to my headaches. I was, I had a horrible diet and this, and I'll admit this, even as a doctor, no one told me how to eat properly. I was living off of a diet of pizza, ice cream, and diet cherry Coke wow. as a physician. Wow. That was that was my diet for years. And not one person ever said, hey, do you think maybe you should get some, you know, fresh veggies in your diet or maybe you should drink some more water instead of having that caffeinated beverage. And so, you know, when I came upon this realization that, you know, I was doing this to myself, if I could just make these changes in my life, 
in a positive way, you know, have a healthier diet, include perhaps some supplements, um, and, you know, really just, you know, do some self-care, whether it's meditation, other ways of stress reduction, exercise. And that's finally what really had helped me turn the corner and improve my symptoms. And so once I realized that, I fell in love with functional medicine. And I, you know, I decided to go ahead and do the full certification because I wanted to offer this to my patients as well. And also, um, you know, it, it changed my career because I was actually in academic medicine for most of my career. And I decided that in order to really um, practice functional medicine and to give the patients the care that they wanted, I would have to leave that model. And I began to, um, I opened up my own practice. And that way, I was able to spend the amount of time that I would need to with my patients to figure out what's the root cause of their problem and what's the best way to treat them. So, um, so it, it made a tremendous difference in my life, my own kind of journey with headaches and how I was suffering for so many years without getting better with traditional medical treatments. Um, and so, it, you know, it's, it's really, it's, it's mind boggling to think that most medical doctors are never even introduced to these concepts. Um, that, that's amazing. And it's, it's motivational to me to continue to try to contribute in my little way of just telling my friends and family and podcast listeners and, and writing about this stuff, because if, you know, if they're going to their docs, you know, as, as we're trained from a young age to do, and they, and the doctors don't know about this stuff, uh, continuing to push this into the forefront is just so important. And I applaud you. What you're doing is so amazing. It's, you know, just getting the word out there and spreading the message that, you know, a lot of these health conditions can be avoided with proper nutrition, lifestyle, and other interventions. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, so when people are, again, looking at what they can do to maintain their own eyesight, what can they do? Okay, great question. So, so I'll, um, I'll just first explain that there are many different eye conditions that can happen as people get older. Some are relatively benign and some can cause significant vision loss. So the ones that can cause vision loss, for example, cataracts, glaucoma, macular degeneration, they're all due to oxidative stress. Mm-hmm. So oxidative stress within our eyes, our body just can't fight, our eye can't, just can't fight against it. So if you can support your eye health with plenty of antioxidants in your diet, perhaps even doing supplements, um, that is the one, you know, one proactive thing that can make the most difference in terms of preserving your eyesight for your lifetime. So when I say um, ha- having a healthy diet with plenty of antioxidants, what I tell my patients is... Um, have a colorful diet, uh, you know, rainbow. So not just, not Skittles, not M&Ms, but a rainbow of whole foods. So all the different colors of, you know, different be- very varied uh, vegetables, so specifically different colors of green, dark greens, lighter greens, different oranges, different yellows, reds, purples, blues, even blacks. These are so important to include in your diet. And what I typically tell people is, you know, if you're having Let's say the average person has three meals a day. That's 21 meals in a week. Try to include a different color of fruit or vegetable with each meal. And you'll get that diversity. You'll get those antioxidants in your diet. Um, The other important thing um, for eye health is omega-3s. And so uh, what many people don't realize is that the retina, which is the light seeing um, uh, tissue in the back of our eye, is the highest concentration of DHA in our body. And that's an omega-3 fatty acid. So more than the brain even. And um, the retina has very high turnover. So it constantly needs um, a really high supply of healthy omega-3 fatty acids. So, uh, you know, whether you're having fish or in your diet a couple of times a week, mercury-free fish preferably, uh, or whether you're having um, other omega-3s like flaxseed oil, um, um, chia seeds, uh, borage oil, whatever, you know, whether it's in your diet or whether you take a supplement like a fish oil supplement or, you know, some other um, uh, omega-3 supplement, it's really, really important to to really support your vision with that. And it also helps with dry eyes as well. So if anyone's suffering from dry eyes, eyes out there, omega-3s um, have actually been shown in studies to improve dry eye symptoms. So it's a great addition to your diet. And then, of course, other antioxidants like glutathione and um, if you wanted to take a supplement like uh, alpha lipoic acid and acetylcysteine, so these are all great things to um, 
to have uh, pro for, to pr preserve your vision. Okay, great. And I won't let anybody, and I've, I've <laughs> asked so many guests uh, to clarify, I won't let anyone ever talk about uh, omega-3s or fish oils without warning them about spoiling them. So do you have a, maybe perhaps a brand uh, that you prefer? I think that's probably the easiest because if you just go buy it from Walmart or CVS, there's a good chance it's gonna be spoiled. Yes, exactly. Um, yeah, I can definitely go rancid. So, um, so I always recommend to my patients to get pharmaceutical grade supplements. So, you know, they're, they're quality, they're batch tested, quality controlled. Um, and they meet certain, you know, basically pharmaceutical type regulations. Um, I really like, there's a Pure Encapsulations brand mm. that has um, DHA, EPA, and also GLA. So, you know, various omega fatty acids. Um, so I, I usually recommend that to my patients for both prevention of dry eye as well as macular degeneration. But there are many, many brands out there. I think um, Nordic Naturals has a great uh, omega-3. Yeah. Um, I'm sure Metagenics has one. So, you know, it's it's you could try out different ones. And sometimes I even recommend taking, you know, one particular brand, you know, in the morning and a different one in the evening to get uh, kind of different formulations working in your favor. So you can mix them up. Okay, yeah, I think a good rule of thumb would be spend a little bit more there on the on the omega threes. Uh, but I'm happy to hear I would a pure encapsulation isn't all that expensive when when you look at the range that you can spend mm -hmm. on omega threes. So uh, I yeah I want to make sure that people under understand that. And um, is there you know, I, I like how you said when you're eating, of course, you're talking about a lot of vegetables and, uh, of, of course, the omega-3s. Uh, is there a lot of, uh, it, you know, it used to be common knowledge, common knowledge or, or an old wives' tale, or maybe that's not a uh, politically correct phrase to use anymore. <laughs> anyway, uh, eating lots of carrots and the beta carotene. Is that, that is, yes, absolutely true. So, okay. you know, so beta carotene is a very potent um, antioxidant um, and it's part of the carotenoid family. And so um, carrots, um, squash, different kinds of squash, butternut squash, acorn squash, summer squash. Those are all wonderful. Pumpkin. Uh, these are, you know, basically the yellow orange types oh, wow. of vegetables and fruits. Uh, but in addition to that, there are a couple of specific eye health vitamins. I like to call them vitamin L, vitamin Z, and vitamin M. So the three eye health vitamins that are also part of the carotenoid family are lutein, mm. zeaxanthin, that, that's with the Z, um, and also mesozeaxanthin. And these are, um, these are called, they're, the, the medical term for it is a xanthophyll carotenoid. So a xanthophyll means yellow. So these are pigments that are yellowish and they are actually, uh, so lutein and zeaxanthin are actually in the retina. And the amazing thing about these molecules is that the retina is typically transparent, but um, these molecules are, are kind of concentrated in the central part of the retina that gives us our central vision. So for example, if someone's seeing 2020, it's because of their central retina that they're able to see 2020. And what these molecules do is they actually absorb wavelengths of light. So it's like having natural sunglasses inside your eye. So, for example, if you are spending a lot of time on a screen, uh, that blue light, these are the molecules that actually absorb those high energy blue light wavelengths and protect your retina from oxidative damage. They also absorb UV light. So, uh, you know, nature has wonderfully put these, um, you know, these important um, antioxidants, vitamins in our eyes uh, as a natural kind of a shield. And um, the other great eye health vitamin that's kind of just gaining popularity, not many people know about it, is um, it's called astaxanthin. Mm -hmm. And I don't know whether whether you or your listeners... I, I do. But I don't know that anybody that I know even knows about it, to yeah. be honest. Yeah. So astaxanthin is considered probably... Some people say it's the most potent antioxidant of them all. I mean, more than glutathione, more than vitamin C, more than vitamin E. And um, it's a very interesting compound. So um, it is part of the, the carotenoids, but it's a reddish carotenoid. And it's actually made by algae. And it's a really interesting kind of a backstory to this. So algae, these algae... Um, that, um, that live in very kind of difficult conditions when they're exposed to high salinity, salinity or high temperatures, not enough nutrients, they actually produce this astaxanthin to protect their DNA. And then marine animals eat the algae 
and it gives them reddish colors. So for example, salmon are pink because they eat this algae. Mm. Um, there are certain bird species also that eat this algae. So for example, flamingos eat this algae and that's why they have the beautiful pink feathers. Krill, nice. shrimp, these are all marine animals that eat this algae. So they're very rich in astaxanthin. I'm sorry, you were gonna ask, no, no, it's all, I'm all just processing this and I hope that I didn't sound uh, to our listeners like I, I really, you know, know what I'm talking, know what I'm talking about here when it comes to different supplements because I found this astaxanthin in, you know, it's, I, I've heard people talk about it, but it's a very kind of, it's not very well known. And so I just started taking it for anti-aging purposes and also it's a, uh, oral sunscreen basically it as is. i understand exactly it. yeah it's great for your skin and your eyes it's so true yeah mm -hmm. and you, you know you'll see it on labels of omega-3s but i just never understood it i just said oh why is this axisanthin in there i don't know just something i didn't know about so i'm just fascinated yeah to hear. i mean i would call it a super nutrient or super antioxidant i mean it trumps them all i mean, you know, based off of laboratory studies and um a lot of people ask me you know how much should i take um, you know, there's no official recommended, di you know, dietary intake, but I would say anywhere from four to six milligrams a day. Okay. Um, and sometimes it comes in, in its, you know, its individual form. You can buy it separately, or sometimes, as you were saying, it can be uh, found in other, you know, mixed supplements or multi, multi for example. So there are a couple of um, brands, eye health brands, that have astaxanthin in them, but not all. So I think even in the ophthalmologic community, it's not that well known. But based off the research that I've done, and actually just recently wrote a white paper on astaxanthin, um, I think that it really will become the one of the, the leading kind of uh, protection um, uh, molecules for, for eye health. I, so. I, I hope, I certainly hope so. I, I, I take a brand from Life Extension that I can, or, or one from Life Extension. I think you're right, it's four milligrams uh, a day and we, mm -hmm. can, we can link that up um, in, the, in the show notes as, as well. I, I'll ask you one more supplement question. Sure, and I know sure. we're getting into the weeds for people, but this is easy stuff that doesn't have a lot of risk for them to do for themselves. So, you know, spending the, I don't know, I think the axisanthin that I bought was maybe $30. I don't think it was too too expensive uh, to try it out. And, you know, I've just heard that it's one of the top anti-aging, uh, mm -hmm. not drug supplements out there. Uh, do you know Bulletproof's eye armor? Um, by any chance, they they have all these uh, supplements that you're that you're talking about the the L's, the Z's, the M's, the axisanthins. Mm -hmm. I I believe so. I haven't looked at the label. I I did look at it a few months back, but I don't recall exactly. I I do know that it has a combination of lutein, zeaxanthin, uh, astaxanthin. I don't know if it has mesozeaxanthin, uh, which is kind of an isomer of zeaxanthin, but um but very very powerful in itself, um and then. In terms of the other eye health um, uh, promoting uh, supplements, so I don't know. Just you know, if you're looking for an eye health supplement, first of all, a lot of people ask me, you know, what's the best one out there? And unfortunately, there is no single supplement that covers everything. I wish there were, but it may have to do with you know they just can't manufacture it, so it'll have everything in it. So sometimes people have to take two separate supplements, but make sure that what you're taking has vitamin A. Vitamin C is very important. It's important for your cornea as well as the structures of the eye. Vitamin E, and then those um, the lutein, zeaxanthin, mesoxanthin, astaxanthin. So uh, again, I haven't looked at the label for the bulletproof brand, um, supplement recently, but um, but I'll definitely take a look. Okay, yeah, I actually, I pulled it up and it does oh, you have did? that okay, meso mesozeaxanthin. Um, and I'm sure half of our listeners are saying, okay, this is a little bit too nerdy for, uh, for <laughs> me, but I couldn't, I couldn't help. I have one very, very uh, easy thing to ask you. Oh, sure, um, sure. And again, maybe this is, this is something I heard on this. Uh, this is something I heard from a very not credible source. Somebody at a party in college told me, if you wear those non-UVA, UVB, glasses you know that they give out as promotional items you see them at yeah. frat parties or who knows yeah. not that i go to frat parties but this is <laughs> probably 10 years ago that i heard about this and they told me that when you put them on your 
iris, I believe, is the part of your eye that expands to let light in, lets more light in than necessary without filtering the UV and can damage your eyes worse than if you didn't have sunglasses on at all. Is there any truth to that? Um, I don't know. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Interesting I, in theory? I, it's possible. It's possible. So basically our iris is very dynamic and it's constantly changing based on the light coming in. So theoretically, I guess if you're wearing dark shaded lenses, your pupil will dilate and your iris will let in more light. And yes, potentially, theoretically, it could let in some more of those harmful rays. Um, I don't know if it's ever been officially studied or looked at, but theoretically, yes. <laughs> okay, interesting. All right, that's that's very good. One more piece of housekeeping, and then sure, uh, sure. Uh, you mentioned you encourage people to try to get their omega threes from fish that are low on the food chain. I forget how that how you said it. Uh, ah, low, low, in, low in mercury. Yes, maybe? low in mercury. Can you tell a cup uh, tell people a couple? fish that you would prefer them to eat rather than tuna? Yeah, so um, the smaller fish like sardines and anchovies, um, uh, they tend to have lower mercury. Um, I, I believe that there are some uh, classes of trout. Now, I, I have to, there's a disclaimer here. I'm a vegetarian, so I don't eat fish, but, um, but you know, from what I've read, that's what, you know, kind of stands out in my mind. Um, and it's, um, it's always better to do uh, wild rather than farmed. Um, so that's the Great. other tip I have. So. Great. Uh, I, I saw, uh, well, anyway, I had, there's so much on your website that I wanted to ask you about, and I know we have to wrap up soon, uh, but you said something interesting earlier, and that was we were talking about how we're fixed and, uh, on a certain uh, distance, and you said every 20 minutes, your 2020 rule is every 20 minutes, take a 20 second break. Is that correct? Yeah, take a 20 seconds. Some people say look away for 20 seconds, but I actually prefer closing your eyes for 20 seconds because that allows you to lubricate. So if you're getting dry mm. eyes, it'll just kind of lubricate and soothe you and then you can start up again. So, okay. Well, I read a very interesting book. I don't know if it, w it was uh, from a Buddhist monk. I don't know if it was from the Dalai Lama or from Thich Nhat Hanh or whomever, uh, mm -hmm. but they talk about setting a bell and they just have a little bell, a little, you know, kind of a little meditation bell that they might ring. Mm -hmm. And it's just your reminder to take a breath and be mindful and just take a quick break to make sure that while you're working, you don't get so wrapped up into what you're doing that you lose your awareness of the rest of the world. And uh, I thought that was, you know, I, I wanted to say, first of all, that your 2020 rule sounds great. And um, do you have any, do you have an app perhaps that you use for that? Or I know the Pomodoro method is quite uh, popular and people, at least at our company, engage in work sprints where they say, 20 minutes, headphones on, don't talk to me. I'm going to do this task right now. And then I'm mm -hmm. going to take a quick break. Uh, do you have, can you elaborate at all on your 2020 rule? So I, I haven't heard of the Pomodoro method. I'll have mm. to read up on it. It sounds okay. fascinating though. So they're sprinting, they're doing kind of like, um, yeah, little just, a, just a, a 20 minutes of focus, deep work. Uh -huh. And they say, I'm not going to open any other windows. Uh, it might even be an application on your computer, but I haven't taken it that far ever. I just take right. it as, all right, 20 minutes, nobody talk to me, go. <laughs> I'm gonna actually do what I was supposed to be working on mm -hmm. right now. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know if there's an app out there. That would be a great app idea is to you know create something like that. But I just use my phone and I set the timer on my phone for 20 minutes and you just hit it. And that way um, you can kind of stay on track because otherwise you lose track of time. You, know, you may think it's 20 sure. minutes, it may actually be 40 minutes. So sure. um, good to have kind of an external cue. And I love what you said earlier about being mindful. So when you are taking that 20 second break, you know, breathe, uh, perhaps as you said, ring a bell and, and focus on the sound rather than on your vision. I mean, it's nice to kind of balance the various senses uh, during the day. So that's a great way to do it. But um, really to just focus 
uh, no pun intended, focus off of your, your visual stimulus and kind of focus on other things. So I love the breathing. Um, I, I do that myself. That's, you know, part of my daily kind of mindfulness, brief meditation practice. I also do other meditation as well, but it's just something people can do at their desks, you know, if they're at work, uh, very simple. And it's, it's so calming. It's just really incredibly calming and it just resets your focus for the next 20 minutes. So that's great. Um, I'm yeah, just so so grateful that you're able to share all of this. Uh, I, I have just maybe one one or two other questions. Mm -hmm. uh, sure, sure. People, uh, people, especially here in Austin, where I am, struggle with allergies. I struggle with them myself uh, quite a bit, mm -hmm. and everybody loves to put eye drops in. And I'm just not sure if that's the best thing for our eyes. I don't like to put anything into my body unless I know that it's pretty safe. So mm -hmm. this is a perfect opportunity to ask you, okay. what is Great. your opinion Great. on Great. eye drops? So, so yeah, so allergies, um, very common, you know, can be really, really debilitating to some people because they just want to rub their eyes out. <laughs> but but um, there's a, there are many drops on the market. And, you know, I actually, I... Um, once I just went and I, I in, in my local CVS, there were three shelves, three full shelves of all the different brands of allergy drops out there. I mean, it was crazy what's out there. But, but what I would say is whatever you're purchasing, um, make sure that it doesn't have um, something that will actually constrict blood vessels too much. Because what happens is, for example... Uh, I'll just talk, talk about a specific brands. So Visine, for example, a lot mm -hmm. of people say I use Visine. It helps me get the red out. You know, it, it really calms me. But what happens is when you use it too often, um, it has a vasoconstrictor. So it constricts your blood vessels. Mm -hmm. It gets the red out. But when you stop using it, there's a rebound redness that happens. And actually, your symptoms may get worse, considerably worse, when you stop using it. So whatever you're using, try to use it in moderation. So, you know, maybe use it only once or twice a day. But there's, um, there are a couple of ingredients in some of these um, over-the-counter allergy drops that are quite safe and very good. So, for example, um, ketodafen is a, it's an antihistamine, uh, very safe to take. So, basically, it's like taking, um, if you were going to take, you know, if you have sinus issues with allergies, you're going to take a Claritin. It's kind of a similar concept. You use the ketodafen. It decreases that histamine release in your eyes, decreases the, the itching, the burning, the redness. Um, but sometimes something as simple as using a lubricating drop without having an actual active ingredient in it, uh, without actually having a pharma, you know, pharmaceutical agent in it can be helpful. So um, if you're getting your wedding drops or lubricating drops, um, a quick tip is make sure that, read the label, make sure that it does not say polyvinyl alcohol. So if you see anything with the word alcohol in it, don't buy it. And the reason is because that polyvinyl alcohol is a cheap ingredient um, a lot of companies use it for their generic drops, but it actually irritates the surface of the eye. It's actually toxic to the cornea. It's not pH balanced to the eye. So it's horrible that, you know, there are so many of these dr drops out there on the market and people think that they're great, but it's actually potentially even harming their eyes. So just stay away from that ingredient. But the other ones are fairly safe to take. Wow. Okay. That's, that's really good to know. So if you're going to have eye drops, use a wedding or a lubricating mm -hmm. uh, drop, which is going to be the most safe with no alcohol in it or this polyvinyl alcohol, as you said. Yes. Um, okay, that makes it. And keto. Ketodafin. 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 Uh, okay, yes. so ketodafin, if you're if you have allergies. Yes, yes. Okay. Because that will definitely decrease that allergic component to it. Okay, and that's just over the counter. It's over the counter, yeah. And there's, okay. you know, there are many brands out there. There's um, Opcon A, Vasocon A, Zatator, hmm. Alway. These are all great brands out yeah, there. Yeah, I've, I've seen some of I've seen some of these out here. Okay, very good. Well, uh, Doc, I, I don't want to take up too much more of your time. Uh, you have been a wealth of knowledge, of course. Uh, I wanted to uh, ask if people wanted to get in touch with you, uh, specifically regarding migraines or any other any mm -hmm. of the other things that you focus on. I know you write a blog. You're quite uh, active on Instagram. Uh, where can where can people reach out to you? Sure. So um so I have. Uh... 
different uh, options for different people, you know, depending on what they what they are, are tuned into. So on Facebook, I have two Facebook groups. Uh, one is called Envision Health. And that's E-N, Envision Health. And that's for health-related or eye health-related topics. And then I have another group called Eye on Migraine, where I talk about a lot of natural migraine therapies. So not pharmaceutical, but natural ways to decrease the frequency and severity of headaches. And then on Instagram, I post on a bunch of different topics, different topics than the Facebook groups. And I, I again, pr provide a lot of information um, through that. And if you specifically, if you have a specific personal question, then the best way to contact me is through my website. You can email me uh, through my website, or um, I actually offer 10 minute complimentary phone consultation. So, you know, I'm based in the New York area, New York City, but if you live elsewhere and you, you know, wanted to get just a little bit of advice, you can reach out and uh, we can do a quick 10 minute phone consult. Um, granted, I can't necessarily prescribe anything or diagnose you, but I can definitely point you in the right direction. Or if you did want to go further, I also offer Skype um, telemedicine consults. And that all that information is on my website. So I'm happy to um, answer any questions you may have or, or help you out in terms of if you wanted to find a provider closer to where you are, I can also help you do that. So, But wow. please reach out to me. I love, I love uh, helping people. Well, that's an incredibly generous of you. So, so thank you for, for being a resource and uh, putting out all this good information in the world. I am going to try to link up all of the resources, uh, including different supplements and eye drops, and uh, of course, links to your website and social media and things like that. And uh, thank I hope you. you know. I really appreciate that. Of one, one last thing I did want to just Please. mention is that. Um, so I am writing a book, uh, and it's scheduled to come out in early 2020, and okay. it's a book on an integrative approach to macular degeneration. Mm. So um, I know most of your listeners are probably a little bit younger than what you would expect for people to get macular degeneration, but perhaps they have family members who have it, parents or grandparents, and um, there are ways through diet and nutrition and lifestyle to prevent macular vision loss from macular de degeneration. And, and um, I don't know if, if you've ever done any genetic testing, uh, but I've done 23andMe just for the fun of it. And it turned out that I had one of the genes for macular degeneration. So um, just having the gene doesn't necessarily mean that you'll go on to get the disease. So I decided to write this book to educate people about what they can do proactively uh, to protect their vision. So, um, so keep an eye out for my book in 2020. Yes, please. If you will, uh, if, if you will let me know, I will definitely spread the word. Uh, I have a slightly higher risk for macular degeneration myself, and my uh, recently deceased grandmother, she had Mac. She was almost blind uh, at that time. She was a smoker until she was 84. So. Uh, Maybe that has Smoking a lot. is one of the yes, yeah, yeah. one of the highest risk factors. Yeah, I, I think yeah. so. So, Grandma Faye, she loved her uh, her her Newports, but yeah. um, any, anyway, uh, yeah. Please do let me know uh, when you have that, and and I'll try to get that out there because of, well, at least I'm going to read it and make sure that I don't get that. I don't go blind. So well, thank um, you. Thank no, you. No, thank you. I will definitely well, let you know. All right. Well, this is uh, Matt Wilson and Dr. Ronnie Bannock signing off. And uh, everybody, thank you so much for being with us today.